Welcome back. Last episode, we discussed the final descent of the Providence Island Project into irrecoverable failure. And this week, we'll discuss the last couple years of the colony's existence. I had intended to finish this in just one episode, but there's just so much that happens that I had to split it in two. But that's okay, because I'm going to need a couple weeks to get the English Civil War episodes all organized and written anyway, so this just means fewer weeks with no episodes. You're listening to the American History Podcast with Sarah Tinsalvola, a show exploring who we are and why by tracing American history from the 17th century to the 20th. By 1639, Providence Island had begun its final collapse. Investors and colonists were still trying to make the settlement work, but the colony simply wasn't recovering from its problems. Bad luck and bad decisions had siphoned money away from the colony, even though privateering was bringing in a huge amount of money. In the face of increasing scrutiny, decreasing meeting attendance, and increased domestic distractions, meetings, notes, and company letters were getting increasingly rushed and decreasingly frequent. And on the island, life was tenser than ever. Civilians lived in constant fear of Spanish attack, with 25 alarms over the course of just nine months. Some months, they had more than one alarm a week. It was just a state of constant worry, combined with resentment, disgust, and irritation. Sherrod stopped administering the sacraments to anyone because his choices were between administering the sacraments to the obviously and unrepentantly sinful captains or administering the sacrament only to the people that he felt were sufficiently godly, which effectively meant exclusively to his own chosen congregation. This is actually an interesting contrast to New England because in New England, denial of the sacrament outside of the minister's congregations was pretty standard, and people didn't really think twice about ministers using that to enforce congregational conformity. People had to enter a covenant with their minister, and membership could be revoked quickly and easily. On Providence Island, that idea was so outlandish and unacceptable that even Cher didn't feel like he could go that far. The company had made its feelings clear regarding denial of the sacrament. It wasn't a weapon. So, to avoid administering it to people who were ungodly, while avoiding using it in a way that looked provocative, he just refrained altogether. But, Shared was still shared. He was still perfectly happy to assert his factional sympathies in other ways. In February, he held a day of thanksgiving for the return of a runaway servant who had nearly died. The boy had escaped in a boat with a group of other servants and slaves, but a storm had marooned them on an island with no fresh water. He was the last survivor of the group, and he had stayed alive by drinking turtle blood, eating seabird eggs, and collecting whatever rain he could in the turtle shells. Dutch sailors had found him, nursed him to health, and then returned him to the English. It was truly an event worthy of thanks, and Butler acknowledged this, but he was also troubled by the fact that Sherrod was so apathetic about the fate of the privateers. Axe, who was by now Butler's closest confidant, had very nearly died just a couple months before, and Sherrod had shown no interest whatsoever. And he refused to officially pray for Butler. The contrast to his reaction about the servant story couldn't have been more obvious. Butler tried to remain positive about Sherrod, 
and he appreciated that Sherrod simply withheld the sacrament rather than using it as a factional weapon, but he noticed. And Butler was also frustrated by how dedicated civilian counselors were to undermining the council of war. They openly celebrated privateering failures, and they just would not cooperate on even the most basic of endeavors. To be fair, you can see where the civilians were coming from, but also to be fair, Butler was trying to implement company orders, and civilian antagonism pushed him toward the privateer's side by default. Back in England, investors tried to deal with the acute issues of slave revolt and sacrament denial. They also appreciated Sherrod's restraint, but at the same time, sacrament denial wasn't ideal, so they tried to recruit a minister who would administer to the people that Sherrod disapproved of. And with regards to the slave revolt issue, they couldn't afford to remove all slaves from the island because of the expenses surrounding Woodcock's death. So they told the colonists that they were just going to leave the situation up to the governor and council, except they would make a couple of rule changes. Now, anyone who left the island would have their slaves confiscated without compensation, rather than being able to sell them and break even. These slaves would work on the public projects for the company. They also encouraged the colonists to sell slaves in New England, Virginia, or the Caribbean, but fundamentally left that up to Butler's discretion. And they found a solution to William Rouse's imprisonment. They gave him money to bribe his jailers and escape, though there's no mention of them doing the same for his crew. And at this point, Bell was demanding a payment of 500 pounds per year in exchange for his testimony in the company's admiralty suits. But the investors refused. The tactic irritated them, and even if they paid Bell, there was no guarantee that they'd end up winning the lawsuits. And at this point, Yet another privateering ship was seized by Algerian pirates, its crew enslaved, and its prizes taken far beyond the company's reach. And most importantly of all, the company continued trying to recruit colonists for Providence Island, and their continued attempts to recruit New Englanders provoked conflict with both John Endicott and John Winthrop, who started exchanging increasingly agitated letters with Lord Say. But, though the investors maintained a commitment to the colony, distractions were starting to pop up. The Earl of Warwick, in particular, had shifted his attention to his new colony of Trinidad and Tobago, and within England, the king was preparing for war against the Scots, something which the Providence Island investors strongly opposed. They actually ended up locking into a new minister, though, when a storm forced a ship carrying a man named, named Nicholas Leverton to land on Providence Island. Leverton was an Oxford-educated minister with a somewhat tarnished reputation who had never taken religion seriously and who had only gotten into the ministry because it was easy to combine with his more frivolous activities while studying at the university. Plus, with the shortage of ministers in England, he had a guaranteed job afterwards, so that was cool. He had spent time in Barbados under Warwick's patronage and had been one of the settlers Warwick had lured over to Tobago. But in Tobago, his group had faced hardships like a rather devastating Indian attack, which is why they had left. And that is when they'd gotten caught in the storm. 
When they landed, Leverton found a group of people wanting to worship according to the English Book of Common Prayer, which Sherrod had abandoned when he had declared his congregation's independence. So, Leverton set up shop and started ministering, even before the company knew about him. An excited butler asked him to administer the sacraments, and he agreed, and Butler even went over to hear him preach one Sunday. It couldn't have been more perfect. Leverton, who wasn't particularly religious, could administer to the ungodly captains and those who refused to enter into Sherrod's covenant, while Sherrod would be free to administer the sacraments to his congregation without being challenged about it. Just kidding. A few days after his arrival, Sherrod met Leverton and convinced the new minister to join his side. Leverton suddenly became an avowed nonconformist, Sherrod's clone in virtually every religious or policy dispute. Why? How? I'll leave that up to you to speculate. We simply don't have the documentation to say with certainty. But they were back to square one. And square one was a rapidly deteriorating relationship between Sherrod and Butler. By now, the two were deliberately trying to provoke and offend each other. They were at the point of bickering over the books the company had sent to Providence Island with Morgan. Butler spent Easter morning with the two Dominican friars, and shared devoted more and more sermon time to irritating the governor. But Butler went off privateering shortly after Easter. He'd always wanted to, and it was a good way to put the issues aside for the next few months and hopefully let everyone cool off. But while he was away, Leverton and Sherrod grew even closer and led the civilians in stronger and stronger agitation. Rhetoric grew more inflammatory, and neither one was administering the sacraments to anyone, and the privateers just kept doing their thing. Butler returned in mid-September, having had one of the worst privateering voyages of all time. He'd had ships taken by the Spanish, their crews imprisoned, the rest getting lost, and the whole group nearly starving. No loot, all loss, near death, and absolutely no acknowledgement of his return by Sherrod or the other civilians. And then, a week after his return, Sherrod announced that he would only administer the sacraments to those who entered into his covenant. New England style. You could either do exactly what Sherrod said, or you could have no sacraments whatsoever. Your kids wouldn't be baptized. You wouldn't get communion. Nothing. And then, the next week, Sherrod made the same announcement. This was the last step in the total division of the colony. And even worse, Sherrod didn't even abide by his own rules. He let Hunt receive the sacraments, even though Hunt didn't and had never belonged to Sherrod's covenant or congregation. He went to the Dutch church. But he was one of the civilian's allies, so Sherrod made an exception. So this wasn't just a split, it was a hypocritical split. And that was Butler's last straw. He had tried and tried and tried to overlook Sherrod's behavior and reunite the island, but after coming back from a near-fatal voyage, his only welcome was Sherrod telling him that he, and perhaps he more than anyone else on the island, was unwelcome at church. So he stopped going, and he started writing negatively about Sherrod, for the first time ever.
He tried briefly on November 5th, which was a day of Thanksgiving for the anniversary of the thwarting of the gunpowder plot, to reconcile with the civilians, inviting Sherrod, his wife, and the civilians to dine with him, but it wasn't enough. By the end of the year, he'd stopped going completely. And he, Axe, and a small group of people turned their attention to a potential silver mine on a nearby island, which they'd found a few months before, and which the company wanted them to develop. In February, the flames were fanned yet again, when Hunt left Providence Island without permission, sailing to the Mosquito Coast and sending his ship back without him. When Butler accused Hunt of intending to sail to New England without permission, the civilian counselors publicly accused Butler of persecution. Butler was at his wit's end, and he wrote to the company that he was their martyr. Every attack that he had sustained had stemmed from his efforts to implement company instructions without support, and the opposing faction prided themselves in tormenting governors. His administration of justice was declared persecution from the pulpit, and Sherrod used his sermons to censure those he disagreed with. Sherrod was wilder and wilder, angrier and angrier, and now he was even abusively yelling at members of his own congregation during Sunday services. Butler said he needed real power, and if they didn't want to give him real power, he wanted permission to leave Providence Island completely. And he wasn't the only one who wanted out. A group of colonists drew up yet another petition threatening to leave, citing, among other grievances, Sher's refusal to administer the sacrament to them, and Butler encouraged them to write their petition. They asked Butler to present it on their behalf in England, and he agreed. Their petition supported everything he'd been saying, and quite frankly, it was an excuse to leave the colony. He asked the council to sign the permission for his departure, but in one last act of spite, the ones in Sherrod's faction refused, so Butler's leaving the island would technically be going against company instructions. But he left anyway, and he left Andrew Carter in charge. That in itself was an act of spite, because not only was he overriding the instructions that the council choose its replacement governor, Butler had selected the man who was most hostile of any to the island's civilian population. Sherrod's faction had accused him of oppression? Well, now they could experience the real thing. Butler arrived in England to find the company's attention solidly and permanently diverted elsewhere, though. The king had briefly imprisoned Say and Brooke for refusing to sign his oath, and after that, he'd been forced to call a parliament. This was the opportunity that Providence Island members in particular had been waiting for for over a decade. Warwick was trying again to get Providence Island sold to the Dutch so that they could recoup a little of their debt and stop spending so much time on a disastrous affair, but again to no avail. And at the same time, Axe and James Riskinner brought five ships loaded with treasure to England. The investors were desperate not to let the cargo be embezzled by the sailors or lost in admiralty limbo, so they focused all their remaining attention on trying to get it back. In the chaos, Butler's petition was pretty much ignored as was the fact that he had left his post with no permission or warning. And back on the island, 
Carter was definitely showing the civilians what tyranny was. And I'd like to think that Butler had never expected him to be as extreme a tyrant as he was. He drank, he caroused, he abused his servants, and he banished and imprisoned civilians without cause or trial, while ignoring even the worst transgressions by the military faction. In one case, he dispossessed and banished a gentleman named Robert Robbins with no legal basis, and sentenced him to hard labor aboard a privateering ship under Captain William Jackson. Robbins was treated predictably terribly on the ship, and then cheated of his rightful share of the voyage's proceeds. Then he was dumped back on Providence Island, where he found his property had been confiscated. Robbins asked for permission to return to England, and Carter agreed, so the now destitute man tried sailing back with another privateer, but that privateer met up with Jackson, and Robbins ended up on Jackson's ship yet again. It took Robbins months to get back to England, and he even ended up in an Irish prison for a while. He tried to get compensation for his troubles from the company, and depicted the colony as being completely devoid of law. And then, a few weeks after Carter took control, a small fleet of ships appeared in New Westminster's Harbor. The colonists ignored it. So many ships were coming and going, and they'd had so many false alarms. So they ignored it and went to bed. When the ships were still there the next morning, they raised the alarm. But before the officers could react, and in fact before most of them were fully dressed, the ships had fired on Fort Warwick. It turns out, that they were, in fact, Spanish ships with a combined thousand troops on board. 600 Portuguese, 200 Black Creoles, and 200 Spanish. The ship's artillery couldn't damage the fort, though, and English return fire soon forced them to withdraw. Then, they sailed south to the area protected by Black Rock Fort, and meanwhile, the English hurried their women to Fort Warwick. Hunt prepared to defend Black Rock and shot off his cannons. A whole five times. Carter, it turns out, had only stocked the fort with five cannonballs, and he left it understocked in other weapons and ammunition, too. And when the cannon fire stopped, the Spanish knew that it was safe to approach the beach. At this point, their only barrier to taking the island was a layer of slippery rocks between the beach and the fort, and as they were trying to cross that, Carter led a force of a hundred civilians and seventeen officers to meet them. As hundreds of Spanish troops shouted insults and shot off their guns, Carter started to duck and retreat, and as he did, the Spanish crossed the rocky barrier and started rushing the fort. Carter ordered Hunt to spike the guns and retreat to Warwick, where they'd all die together, but reinforcements arrived just in time. And the reinforcements demanded that the fort stand its ground. Carter argued, but they insisted and they won the debate. They shot at the approaching troops while their slaves threw rocks, and before long, most of the Spanish officers were dead. The leaderless soldiers panicked and ran back to the beach, shouting requests for quarter, but the English, who may or may not have known what they were saying, kept shooting until they'd killed most of them, too. The only ones who survived were those who fled into the hills. And those were mostly low-ranking soldiers who were just trying to survive the conflict. So when the English found them and offered them quarter, they happily surrendered. 
The battle was over. The slaves had fought loyally, and only two Englishmen had been killed. One runaway and one miscreant, so no loss in colonist eyes. The only thing that had really been damaged was Carter's reputation, and his cowardice became one of the overwhelming themes and accounts of the battle. Sherrod even said that the reinforcements had found Carter hiding in the kitchen, eating the food stored there. I think we can write that off as an embellishment, but that's how he was seen. But then things took a turn for the darker. After the soldiers who had surrendered reached New Westminster, Carter had every single one executed. Most were hanged, but some were killed in other ways. Carter personally cut off the expedition leader's arm and watched him bleed to death. When the man asked why he'd been singled out for such a death, Carter responded that he'd seen him kill one of his slaves with a rock during the battle. The colonists held a day of thanksgiving for their victory and burned all the Spanish religious artifacts while the Indians watched to show them how worthless Catholicism was. But immediately after that, Sherrod and the civilians moved to oust Carter. They confronted him, saying that they had the right to appoint their replacement governor and that they chose Lane, not Carter, the tyrant, the coward, and the murderer of prisoners. In response, Carter privately armed some of the, quote, ruder sort of the island and had them seize Lane, Sherrod, and Leverton. Then he sent them back to England, but he didn't send them back to the company. No, he sent them directly to Archbishop Laud with a letter telling him that they were Puritan separatists. This would immediately disqualify Sherrod and Leverton from further clerical work, and it could open up the others to punishment too. Now, unfortunately for Laud, but fortunately for our colonists, Laud had been imprisoned by the time they reached England. They ended up in company hands after all, and the company was fundamentally sympathetic to their point of view. In fact, they kind of got a hero's welcome when they reached London. The company affirmed that they were supposed to have the right to choose their own replacement governor, but they did say that Sherrod and Leverton should have backed down so that the island wouldn't be left without a minister. They were horrified, both by Carter's cowardice and even more by his shooting of soldiers who had surrendered under promise of quarter, so they ordered him and his closest associates to return to England. A handful were allowed to relocate to Warwick's Trinidad, but that was it. And they allowed the colonists to return to Providence Island, something that both Lane and Leverton were eager to do. Sherrod, on the other hand, was fed up with the whole project and just wanted to stay in England, so they got the House of Lords to find him a place to preach in England. He never quite fit in with a congregation, though, and after a couple years, each congregation would petition to have him replaced, and the lords would find him somewhere else to preach. Sandwich, Warwickshire, Sandwich again, and then finally Cornwall, where he died shortly afterward. Hal had also stayed in England, preferring to stay there and oppose the enclosures to returning to the New World. He was disenchanted with Parliament before the first shots of the war were even fired, writing in his book that though Parliament had attacked the enclosures in the Grand Remonstrance of 1641, by 1643 they'd begun to support the practice because it had enriched them. They were the enclosers. He died not long after finishing his book, after being disappointed by every group he'd once considered ideological allies.
But however it had happened, the colony was now free of its most problematic residents. Both the harshest of the captains and the most argumentative of the civilians were gone, and at this point the company also decided to make all concessions regarding private property, local political representation, and civilian control of the island. And this helped them finally succeed in recruiting a few hundred New Englanders to go to Providence Island. New England also had its own bitter divisions, the antinomian controversy, the debate between the magistrates and the deputies, and in addition, it was experiencing economic strain because of the slowing down of immigration as the king called a parliament. Plus, quite frankly, New England was cold, and moving to a tropical island sounded kind of nice. These colonists had already been considering setting up a new colony in Florida, but going to Providence Island was a great alternative because their transportation would be paid by the company, and there the foundations of a colony had already been built. The remaining New Englanders showed firm contempt of those who had decided to relocate, dismissing them as people who were weak both in mind and in body, who were seeking liberty and license. Choosing to go to a place where all men were preachers and no hearers of the word. The people who were now prepared to go to Providence Island included future fifth monarchist Thomas Venner, as well as Thomas Letchford. And it was from this group that they selected Carter's replacement as governor, John Humphrey. They would send an interim who would do nothing more than maintain the status quo and turn away potentially troublesome colonists. But when Humphrey arrived, he'd set up the new society, and he would use Providence Island as nothing more than a base to colonize the mainland, as had so often been suggested in the past. He would also help sell the majority of Providence Island's slaves and other Caribbean colonies. And in fact, this process would begin even before he arrived, with a thousand slaves sold primarily in St. Kitts and transported by William Pierce. There had already been rumors of a second slave revolt, and to minimize the threat, they would get rid of any slaves they didn't specifically know were loyal. So in 1641, the first contingent of Humphrey's men sailed for Providence Island on Pierce's desire. A few weeks later, they arrived in St. Kitts, but there they had a decision to make. When they told the island's residents that they were Providence-bound, the locals told them about rumors that a Spanish fleet had been spotted off the coast of Providence Island. Should they continue to their destination or turn back? <laughs> 